do again. Okay, <laughs> is that right? And uh, I trust you had a good week and uh, you are ready for our study of God's word. <clears throat> if you would turn with me to the passage that was just read, we would appreciate that. And we want to uh, speak on the parable of the unmerciful servant. Well, all of this begins because Peter had a question that troubled him. That wasn't unusual. Peter also had a theory about the right answer, and that wasn't unusual either. Peter asked, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? That's the question. Till seven times, that's the theory. Now, Peter must have really thought that he was being generous when he made claims like this. After all, in discussions that the rabbis were having in Peter's day, they had decided that you should forgive a brother three times for a repeated sin, but on the fourth time that he commits the same sin, you don't have to forgive him. So Peter must have thought, I'm really generous being willing to forgive some seven times. And uh, he must have thought the Lord was going to heap praise upon him. And yet Jesus's answer must have startled Peter and anybody else who was listening. And to us, it may also be startling as we see what Jesus said. Jesus replies to Peter, Peter, not till seven times, but till 77 times. Now, what did Jesus mean? Did he mean that we should keep a running tally in terms of everyone we know? And uh, every time that the person commits a certain offense and we forgive him, we keep score and we should forgive him at least until he has done us wrong and asked for forgiveness 77 times. And then if he does it one more time, then you don't have to forgive him. Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, that hardly sounds like Jesus. Jesus, in effect, was saying that you should always forgive those who ask. The discussion in this parable is put in terms of a brother, a fellow believer, who does something wrong and then asks you for forgiveness. <clears throat> now, I think Jesus would likely say something similar, if not identical, if the person who had wronged us was a non-believer, but Jesus has been talking in verses 15 through 11 uh, through 17 about uh, dealing with someone who has uh, committed a sin against us, and yet they are a brother or a sister in Christ. And so it's natural <clears throat> that Peter should ask this question about forgiving a brother. Well, Peter, uh, Jesus did much more than just answer Peter's questions. In fact, his answers were sufficiently brief enough that maybe Peter would have been so startled that he wouldn't have gotten the point that Jesus had in mind. So Jesus not only gives the answer, but he gives this parable, which explains why it is that we must always be forgiving. Now, I think it's hard to imagine a parable that uh, is more relevant to us in our interpersonal relationships. 
it would be great if no one ever did anything <clears throat> to offend us, to sin against us, but that's not so. In fact, we know that on occasion we do things that sin against another brother or sister as well. It would be equally terrific if no one ever had an unforgiving spirit. But of course, that's not so either. You see, Peter asked a question that really troubles all of us if we're on it. And he didn't ask it of his fellow disciples. He didn't ask it of the rabbis, the Romans, or any other group of human beings. He asked this question of Jesus, who is God, and as a result, he's the one who makes the rules about such things as forgiveness. Well, if you've ever wondered <clears throat> how much wiggle room, so to speak, the Lord allows us to be unforgiving, then we really need to hear what Jesus teaches in this parable. Well, what does the parable teach us about forgiveness? The first thing that I see taught very, very clearly is that Jesus says, God forgives us if we ask, no matter what we owe. Now, look at the parable and you will see that indeed that is what Jesus is saying. Verse 24 we read that uh, the king came and he wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, that sounds like an awful lot anyway, but to put it even more clearly, a talent at that time would have been worth about $1,200 in our money today. In fact, if you add in inflation, today this amount could be worth over a billion dollars in our money. You see, this was an impossible sum for a slave to pay. Where would he get that kind of money? In fact, there wouldn't be too many free persons who would have that kind of money and be able to pay what was owed. Well, what happens very uh, in the parable as the next thing is very, very interesting. In verse 25 and 26, the servant asks for some extra time to work to pay off the debt. I don't know whether that's ever been your experience, but I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere, sometime in your life, you owed someone something you couldn't pay, and uh, you asked for more time to do it. Well, uh, verse 25 says, but since he did not have the means to repay, that's the slave, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. Now that sounds very harsh to us, but the fact of the matter is it wasn't unusual at that time. In fact, outside of Israel itself, this practice of selling the family and all that it had, if the family couldn't pay a debt, was, as a matter of fact, quite common. So what the master is saying is not unduly heartless or unusual, but it definitely shows that the slave and his family were in a hopeless situation. There was just no way they were going to be able to pay this. So 
the slave, according to verse 26, pleads for more time to repay. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now, I don't know how this slave ever thought that was going to happen, given his circumstances. But nonetheless, it's something that we oftentimes uh, think of saying, maybe we even do say, when we owe somebody something we can't repay. And we say, well, just give me a little more time and I'll work it out. We don't know exactly how we're going to do that, but we think if I can stall for some more time, maybe I can figure out something that will allow me to pay this off. Well, uh, that is something that shows that this slave was certainly desperate. His situation was hopeless, and he was grasping for anything that might improve the circumstances and the situation. But notice what happens in verse 27. Notice what his master does. And of course, the master in this parable represents God. And the slave represents us, our situation. Well, verse 27 says that the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. This, friends, goes way beyond anything that could have been expected. The slave asked for more time to pay, and the master could have come back and said, okay, I'll give you another six months. I'll give you another year or two to pay. And that would have given the slave some release, but that's not what the master does. According to verse 27, stirred with compassion, over the plight of his servant, he does something that goes way, way, way beyond anything that could be expected. What's that? He cancels the debt. Now, we talked a few moments ago about how much money was actually involved in our term. You might have thought it would be a little bit wiser for this master to cut the debt in half or double or triple the amount of time that the slave had to pay it off. Either one of those things would have been better than his circumstances at the time, but the master goes way, way, way beyond anything that <clears throat> the servant could have expected or imagined. He canceled the whole debt completely forgiven. You don't ever have to repay anything. And oh, by the way, you're not going to prison either, along with your family. Wow, you could hardly imagine a more merciful reaction than that. God grants the pardon to we who are sinners and owe him so much just as the master completely canceled the debt of the slave. And all of this, of course, is intended as an illustration of the rules for how often we should forgive our brothers and sisters when they ask for forgiveness. Because Remember again, verses 21 and 22, Peter asked, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but to 70 times seven. What Jesus is saying is don't keep track until 
you get 70 times seven and then you can be unforgiving. Jesus is saying, never fail to forgive. Well, what does that look like, Jesus? Well, then Jesus goes and tells this parable. It looks like a situation where someone is hopelessly indebted to us. They've done something incredibly mean or unkind. And uh, we have all kinds of authority over them to make their life miserable. And yet they come and ask for some kind of forgiveness. And instead of giving a little bit, we cancel the debt entirely. The parable that Jesus is telling illustrates God's merciful forgiveness to repentant sinners, and that is intended as an illustration of how often we ought to be willing to forgive others who have done us wrong. Not till seven times, Peter, but 77. In other words, forgive no matter how much is owed. But, you know, we're probably a bit startled by Jesus's response because like Peter, we oftentimes are in a situation where someone does something wrong to us and then they come and they ask for forgiveness and we do forgive them. And maybe they do the same thing a second or a third time and ask forgiveness. And we say, well, okay. And then we believe if this person ever does that again, well, then he's not really sorry and I don't have to forgive him. And regardless of how that other person wrongs us and pleads for forgiveness, we feel that, uh, well, enough is enough. And no, I am not going to forgive you this next time. And even more than that, I have a right to be unforgiving because you are not genuinely sorry. You say you are, you continue to ask for forgiveness, but then you don't live as though that's what's really on your mind. So for Peter to suggest that uh, we ought to forgive someone who's done us wrong seven times, wow, that must, in Peter's mind, he must have thought that's the most generous reaction you could possibly give. Jesus surely will affirm that what I've just said is true. But as the parable shows, Jesus is not impressed with Peter's answer. He gives an answer that amounts to saying you should never fail to forgive. No matter how many times the person who has wronged you asks for their forgiveness. But there's something else that this parable teaches us as well. And it is this, Jesus' parable teaches us that others owe us very little, and yet we mercilessly refuse to forgive them. The parable doesn't stop with Jesus forgiving the slave, it goes on. And we find out in verse 28 that the slave who was forgiven by the master went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. Now, a denarius was the amount you would get for a day's worth of labor if you were a foot soldier or a common laborer. So 
a hundred denarii would represent a hundred days worth of work. That amount of money was not insignificant, but it's nothing in comparison to what this first slave owed his master. Well, uh, so you would think that having been forgiven yourself, you would uh, be generous to someone else. And uh, yet that's not the way the slave who'd been forgiven reacts to the person who owes him the hundred denarii. In verse 29, we read, so his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. First of all, he had seized this other slave and began to choke him by the neck, verse 28 says, and he demands that he be repaid. And the second slave reacts exactly the way the first slave had reacted, but uh, the first slave doesn't respond as the master had responded to him. In verse 30, we read that he, referring to the first slave, was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now, this sounds rather merciless, but it's actually even worse than it may sound. Verse 29, the second slave asked for more time to pay. He asked exactly what the first slave had asked. But there's no mercy that is granted whatsoever. I mean, he could have gone and killed the second slave, but that wouldn't be legal. He'd be in great trouble for that. And uh, the debt that the second slave owes is really too small to sell him legally into further slavery. So what does he decide to do? Put him in prison. That he could legally do. But it's sort of the worst possible punishment, the worst possible treatment that he could give to the second slave. Why? Well, because when you put the second slave in prison, he probably would have to do some work there along with his fellow prisoners and maybe just maybe he might get paid for that work and uh, he might be required to stay in prison until he earned enough to pay off the hundred denarii debt but uh, slaves working in prison were not going to be paid that much so this was going to take quite a bit of time and, um, you know, you would think, well, let him go out and get a, a job, a better paying job. And maybe that will allow him to pay things off even faster. But when you throw him in prison, that's not an option that you've given to this slave. You see, putting him in prison was legally something the first slave could do but it was totally heartless. He is demanding that he get his pay, but he's put that second slave in a position where seemingly it's gonna take forever for him to pay back the debt that he owed. Well, this response, by the first slave is especially troublesome because the second slave admitted his guilt and asked for forgiveness himself. He did exactly what the first slave had done. 
And God had generously, the master had forgiven the first slave, but the first slave will not do the same thing when the second slave admits his guilt and asks for forgiveness. You see, one of the things that you're seeing is how different is the forgiving heart of God as opposed to that of us. God won't, give, won't forgive if we don't repent, but he will pardon us if we do. That's what he did to the first servant. That's what God does to all of us when we come to Christ and ask that he be our savior and forgive us of our sin. There's no unrelenting attitude that God has. When we do that, he is thrilled to forgive us. How much better it would be for us to follow God's example than to follow the example of the first slave in his relationship to the second slave. Well, there's one other thing that I think this parable clearly shows us, and it is the following. Follow God's example and be liberated. Follow the servant's example and be imprisoned. You see, when we have an unforgiving spirit, it's not as though God doesn't know According to verse 31, it turns out in this parable that the other workers come and tell the master what's gone on. God, of course, is omniscient. He doesn't need anybody to give him a report on what we're doing. He knows who's been forgiving, who has not been forgiven. But notice the reaction from the master in verses 32 through 34. The master is furious with this first slave. If his slave had forgiven the second slave, well, none of this would have happened. And the master is especially angry at the first slave because of how much he had forgiven that first slave. Look at verse 32. Then summoning him, that is the master summoning the first slave, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt. Now, the phrase all that debt in the original is emphatic. It begins this particular verse. How in the world can you be so unmerciful when you were so horribly indebted to me and I forgave you all of that debt? I didn't give you a different time frame to pay it or anything like that. I canceled the debt and you've been so nasty, so mean to this person who owes you money. Verse 33, should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? Of course he should have, but he didn't. And as a result, his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the jailers. Actually, some of your translations say jailers, Others say torturers. Um, the word that is translated there has the idea more than just somebody who's going to imprison you. They're going to actually torture you because you have done such horrible wrong. You're going to be handed over to the torturers until you repay all that was owed to the master. Well, if he's handed over to prison and he's tortured, there's no way to make money. How, and he owes 
gigantic amount of money, how in the world is he ever going to pay that off? He's not. And that was why he pleaded with the master to give him some mercy. And the master did. And then this first slave goes out and uh, he tries to collect money from a second slave who owes him, well, it's significant, but nothing like the first slave owed his master. And when the second slave asked for the same consideration, compassion, understanding, he refuses, the first slave refuses and throws him into prison. Clearly, this is unacceptable. And the master, when he hears it, he makes sure that uh, the first slave winds up being sentenced to prison for as long as originally he was supposed to be there. Well, what is the point of this parable about forgiveness? Verses 32 and 33, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Here's the connect. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave who also entreated you? Yeah, we know that even though it's not there. Even as I had mercy on you. You see, the point is that since God has forgiven us so much, how can we possibly fail to forgive others who owe us so little. I forgave you, the master says, because you asked for mercy. Shouldn't you have done the same thing? Of course he should have. If we refuse to forgive those who ask us, then verse 35 says your heavenly father won't forgive you. God has so much compassion on those in need that he can't accept those devoid of compassion and mercy. Now, this doesn't mean that he's going to undo what he's already forgiven the first slave, but what the first slave has done to the second slave is a horrendous offense in itself, and he will have to pay for that. So, what's the answer, Peter? How often shall my neighbor sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? No, Peter, not till seven times. That's nowhere near enough. Always be willing to forgive those who have done us wrong and ask us for their forgiveness. Well, the message for us, I think, here is quite clear. Forgive others since God has forgiven us so much, and you're going to be free. If the first slave had done that with the second slave, he would have been free. And uh, he would have exhibited compassion. He would have shown that he'd learned something from the way his master treated him. But he didn't do that. And as a result, the first slave doesn't wind up free at the end of this. He winds up in jail. He winds up with his master being extremely angry with him to the point that he imprisons him. He has incurred guilt again before God. You see, refuse to forgive and God will hold us accountable. He won't forgive us for being merciless. We will be enslaved and bound by our anger and our desire for revenge over our enemies. 
and also enslaved by our sense of guilt for being so unforgiving. Well, Christian, this morning, it's really very hard to fault the logic of this parable, isn't it? I mean, the point is, since God has forgiven us so much, how can we be unforgiving to others who ask us for forgiveness? When you look at it this way, it's hard to make a convincing case that we have any kind of right to refuse forgiveness to those who ask, even if they ask for forgiveness, we forgive, they do the same thing over and over, no matter how much they do the same thing or something else offensive. When they ask forgiveness, we need to forgive them. Forgive them. I'm wondering this morning if there is someone you need to forgive, perhaps a family member, perhaps an acquaintance at work, perhaps someone else who attends here. You know you need to forgive, <clears throat> but you haven't quite found it within your heart to do so. And perhaps they have asked for your forgiveness, maybe even begged for it, but you refuse to do so, or conditions are offered that they have to meet that uh, before you'll forgive them, that will utterly humiliate them. If that's our response, again, the message of this parable has a question for us. In light of how much God has forgiven us, how can we fail to forgive others who ask us for their forgiveness. There's a message here for those who have wronged their brother or sister in Christ. We need to admit that to God and to our brother or sister. Repent of it and ask forgiveness. Even if your brother or sister in Christ won't forgive you, it's still our responsibility to admit our wrong and seek forgiveness. But if the person you have wronged understands the message of this parable, how can they possibly reasonably refuse you? Go and ask for forgiveness. So what's the point of this parable? It's not to distinguish how many times you have to forgive from the times when you don't have to. That's not the point at all. The point of the parable is to show what an unforgiving spirit is and to teach that being unforgiving is unacceptable. We need to be people who are always willing to forgive. And if you have wronged someone else, you need to be someone who's willing to admit that, repent of it, and ask for forgiveness. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for this parable. When we look at its subject, we have to admit that in our interpersonal relationships, Sometimes with the people that we're closest to, there is something that happens that angers us and the relationship is strained. And the longer we wait for the I'm sorry, we may even feel that we have an increasing right to withhold forgiveness. Lord, we've seen from this parable that that attitude is totally, totally wrong. We should always be forgiving to one another. Lord, if we are that brother or sister who has been wronged, 
And we have felt that um, we didn't have to offer forgiveness. May we think long and hard about the message of this parable. And Father, if we are the one who has done wrong, rather than trying to isolate us from the person who's been injured by what we've done, we need to come forward, admit that we're wrong, ask for forgiveness, rather than trying to revisit the incident and making an argument that we really didn't do anything wrong. Lord, help us to remove that kind of mindset and come instead with the mindset that I've done wrong and I need to ask forgiveness. And even if my brother doesn't grant it, it's still my responsibility to ask for forgiveness. And for those who have been wronged, it's our responsibility to be willing to forgive the offending brother or sister, even if they don't come and ask us for. Lord, I pray that you would take the truths of this parable and apply them to our minds and hearts. And may its teaching, as we live it out, make a difference in the way we respond to other brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask all these things with thanksgiving in Christ's precious name. Amen.